I'm going to talk about arthroscopy of the lower extremity, uh, uh, lower extremity in general, but particularly arthros arthroscopic techniques. Some diagnosis, but mostly what's kind of new and exciting. Uh, so my background, in case anybody was wondering, uh, Scott already kind of covered. I'm board certified in orth both orthopedic general surgery and sports. I uh, did my sports fellowship in California at UC San Francisco, residency uh, at Harvard Medical School in New York. Arthroscopy is kind of an exciting technique uh, in that pretty much every joint in the body can be scoped. Anything with a space, you can stick a camera in it. Uh, so most commonly are the knees. Uh, more commonly these days are hips and obviously shoulders. Elbows and ankles are the primary things that I'll, I'll uh, be putting a camera into on most days. There are big advantages to arthroscopic procedures. Uh, most traditional treatments, or a lot of traditional treatments, are, uh, can be done arthroscopically now uh, with similar, similar results uh, that the traditional surgeries had, uh, and with smaller incisions, less post-operative pain, quicker recoveries in a lot of cases, uh, which overall makes for a more pleasant operative experience for our patients. So, uh, depending on the joint, it, uh, the, the instruments are pretty much the same. You have a uh, camera uh, and various portals. Usually I'm only using two in the knee. Uh, instrumentation over here where you can do all kinds of things from cutting to shaving to putting in implants and anchors and stitches. Uh, the, they vary for, by joint depending on the size and some specialized instruments uh, uh, depending on the, the, uh, which joint you're working on. So we'll start with the knee. I'll spend most of my time talking about the knee. A lot of these techniques are applicable to other joints as well, so it's kind of transferable. So there's a lot of conditions of the knee. Our colleague Dave will be talking about uh, anterior knee pain, which covers the first two, which are generally non-operative conditions. Uh, I'll spend most of my time talking about meniscal tears and ligament injuries uh, and osteochondral defects, uh, which are often treated arthroscopically. Uh, and then arthritis was more a subject of Skip's talk. So meniscal tears come in a variety of um, forms. They can be either, generally they're divided into traumatic, uh, which are either non-displaced or displaced. So non-displaced traumatic tears are very common. Probably 70, 80% of our patients with meniscal tears uh, have um, non-displaced tears or so-called stable tears, which can produce pain symptoms for a little while often will resolve with conservative measures, physical therapy, anti-inflammatory medications, uh, not require surgery. Uh, the displaced ones are the bucket handles or the flap tears or some of the big radial tears which can uh, move around in the joint like a pebble in your shoe and produce mechanical symptoms, uh, locking, catching, popping, that sort of thing, which often will require uh, surgery, arthroscopic procedures. And then you have the degenerative type tears. These are the ones that are more associated with arthritis. Uh, these are the patients who come in with obvious arthritis on their x-ray, but had had an MRI from somewhere else and say, yeah, doc, I have a meniscus tear. Actually, you have arthritis, but uh, you know, this is probably secondary. And oftentimes we um, will treat the arthritis and kind of forget about these degenerative tears since they typically are not the primary source of the pain. Uh, so meniscal, this is what the uh, a standard traumatic so-called bucket handle tear looks like. So the tear is right through here. This is a little probe that's reaching in and pulling the, showing that it is actually unstable. You can pull it away from the rim where it belongs. Um, this is another type of unstable tear called a, a, a flap tear or a parrot beak uh, sometimes is what these are referred to where it's a, f a flap of f tissue that is detached from the rest of the meniscus and this too can move around and cause symptoms. And then this is what the degenerative tears look like typically, sort of a uh, mangled up mess of, of damaged tissue. And you can see the rough cartilage surface here on the femoral condyle, probably on the tibia as well, that would, be, that would indicate that it's more of an arthritic condition. So they can the, the traumatic tears, the mechanism of injury is usually a twisting type injury. Uh, someone plants their foot on the field and tries to turn one way and feels a pop in their knee, similar to what, uh, how you would damage a, um, a ligament, uh, usually associated with swelling. Uh, and then these mechanical symptoms that I described, clicking, catching, or locking, where 
Uh, it feels like something's moving around in your knee and producing swelling and pain. Sometimes the knee will actually lock up in a certain position and you can't unlock it. We see this happen, come to the um, high school kids coming to the emergency room with their knee bent at 30 degrees and they can't straighten it out. So uh, the way it's diagnosed, like everything else we do, you start with a physical exam. Uh, the, this, whether it's a medial or a lateral meniscus tear usually would be associated with corresponding joint line tenderness. You press on the side of the knee uh, where the joint line is and it hurts. Um, then there are these various other tests named after doctors who invented them decades ago. Uh, basically have the same idea where you put an axial load on the lower limb, uh, kind of push the heel into the knee. Uh, so you're driving the tibia up into the knee and then kind of do a twisting type motion, which if there's a meniscal tear, will pinch it and cause pain. Um, it's a pretty accurate test for uh, uh, recognizing meniscal tears, particularly the unstable kind. Uh, and then you follow it up with x-rays, really to rule out arthritis, uh, which you can see on a weight-bearing view by narrowing of the joint space. Um, and that can change how you manage a meniscal tear or otherwise. Uh, you know, if there's arthritis, then kind of all bets are off as far as the meniscus goes. MRIs are very accurate at uh, seeing the meniscus. So this is the femur, this is the tibia on an MRI. This little dark triangle here is a normal meniscus. Uh, and when you see a dis uh, change in the shape of the meniscus, no longer triangular, so oftentimes you'll see a little white line running through it, which is fluid. That's indicative of a tear, and often it's confirmatory when you get the MRI and you're planning to do surgery. Uh, initial treatment for all tears, except for the real grossly unstable ones, usually are conservative uh, rest, see if the inflammation settles down, take some anti-inflammatories, ice it. Uh, physical therapy uh, can help to strengthen the muscles around the knee joint and stabilize uh, what could be a maltracking problem of the patella, which can produce pain even in the setting of a meniscal tear. You solve that problem and the pain goes away. You don't have to worry about the meniscus. Uh, and then lastly, surgery uh, for the unstable tears or the tears that produce chronic pain and just aren't getting better or keep recurring every time uh, a patient tries to get back into uh, full uh, high-level activity. Uh, traditionally, you know, most of the tears were debrided. This is still true of uh, the majority of tears. The, the degenerative tears, uh, definitely, uh, this kind of thing, if it is producing mechanical symptoms, um, the, the treatment is to go in with a shaver, basically, and remove all of this damaged tissue and any parts of it that could be unstable. Repairs have evolved quite a bit over the past couple of decades. Uh, it used to be an open procedure um, where you could go in initially arthroscopically and if you found a, re uh, a meniscus tear that needed to be repaired, um, it would, you'd have to then make a bigger incision usually in the back and pass needles either inside out or outside in and uh, tie knots uh, on the outside of the capsule. Uh, pretty complex surgery, uh, often associated with risks to some of the neurovascular structures or ligaments around the knee. So uh, over the past couple of decades, these newer all inside uh, instrumentation have evolved. So these are meant to be done arthroscopically through the little poke holes that you see in the front um, that can handle pretty much all meniscal tears except for the ones that are very close to the front, the anterior horn tears, which obviously you'd have to do a 180 degree turn to reach those, but even those can be done just by extending your one of your portal excisions a tiny bit just to uh, be able to get a, a needle and a retractor in there. But uh, these have really revolutionized the way we treat majority of um, repairable meniscus tears. Uh, and what it involves is this little device that has two anchors in it uh, and, a, and a stitch with kind of a loose um, uh, knot that you push the anchor in one, into one part of the meniscus uh, like this. Uh, and deploy it so the anchor flips 90 degrees and then you pull it out and you put it in below the tear. Here's the tear. Uh, and then when you deploy the second anchor, which flips sideways 90 degrees, you have a loop between the two and it's a slip knot. So you simply pull the knot tight 
Uh, and this is what it looks like arthros uh, uh, our, through the arthroscopy camera. Uh, the, you can put in as many of these as you want, uh, depending on the size of the tear, and in varying configurations. They can be horizontal or um, vertical uh, and have pretty good results, as good, again, as the open procedures, 85 90% success rates in getting these meniscal tears to heal. Um, the, uh, there are various different devices. This is one, one type of device, but there are several on the market that are all kind of the same idea. Moving on to ligament injuries, particularly in the knee. Um, they are also due to a twisting injury. The player who's out running around on the field and plants their foot and tries to turn one way and their foot remains in that position and they feel a pop usually associated with a uh, sensation of something tearing uh, along with a lot of swelling, typically more than you'd see with a meniscus uh, injury. Um, and then down for the count, usually not able to get back in the game, kind of thing where you get carted off the field on a stretcher. Um, various valgus stress, so if the knee moves this way, uh, it's more likely to cause damage to the collateral ligaments, the medial collateral or the lateral collateral or the posterior lateral ligament complex. Uh, or, it, depending on the amount of translation, could also injure the ACL or the PCL, the two cruciates in the middle of the knee. Uh, all, all usually associated with swelling, uh, ligament involved can often be determined by the amount of swelling and whether it's intra-articular or outside of the knee joint. Uh, outside of the knee joint, particularly medially, is usually more suggestive of an MCL tear. Uh, and then symptoms of instability. So what happens after an, AC, like, uh, an AC, uh, isolated ACL tear uh, is the swelling will go down, the symptoms will often, uh, the pain symptoms will often resolve. Uh, and most people can uh, get back to a lot of normal day-to-day -day activities. They can even run in a straight line, they can get on a bike, they can swim. Uh, but if they, as soon as they try to cut or pivot, their knee feels loose, uh, where similar to the initial injury, the knee just doesn't support them in, in those high level uh, switching directions, particularly with a, with a load. And that's highly suggestive of an ACL tear uh, or injury. So the treatments for the ACL, again, well, it's a history and exam uh, patient who has this type of injury on in the field and then ongoing <laughs> symptoms of instability. Uh, almost uh, routine uh, across the country for the most part, uh, ACL injuries are not operated on right away. Usually it's about six to eight weeks minimum after the injury uh, before performing any type of surgery. Uh, the reason being you want the swelling to come down, you want the capsule of the joint and everything to recover, uh, and there's a very high risk of stiffness if you operate too soon. So the role of physical therapy is to get the swelling under control have the pain go away and to restore that full range of motion, uh, which minimizes the risk of uh, post-operative stiffness. There are still a few centers around the country that operate on ACLs acutely. Uh, they tend to be the Vail and Aspen clinics uh, out west in Colorado who, if they don't operate on their patients right away, they will come back to Massachusetts and have me fix it. So, um, so the, the surgery timing is very important. Again, about six to eight weeks uh, after the injury. Um, so exam, uh, there's various, uh, you know, again, swelling, stiffness, uh, pain are obvious, but specific to the ACL, there's a test called the Lachman test. And what you're doing is uh, stabilizing the femur with one hand and with a knee bent at 30 degrees, you gently pull forward on the tibia. And as you can see where the ACL sits, it's this red structure here on this diagram you would see, uh, you'd feel laxity. And when you compare it to the other, some people have inherent laxity, so you always have to compare it to the other knee to see if there's an actual difference. Because um, if there is uh, a difference, it is highly suggestive of at least a partial tear of the ACL, if not a complete tear. There's the anterior draw test, which is very similar, except the knee's bent at 90 degrees. Uh, which uh, is a little less sensitive than the uh, bent at 30 degrees because here you're isolating just the ACL. This could be um, due to other laxity and other ligaments. Uh, and um, So not quite as accurate, but still useful. Um, and here's more of a diagram of, what ha of, of the actual motion of the, of the uh, 
of the hand, uh, hands on, on the femur. It's a little easier to do an anterior draw at 90 degrees because you can support the lower leg with your weight by kind of sitting on the foot, um, especially with a bigger person. Um, you know, when you're doing uh, rookie players for the NFL team who have legs like tree trunks, this is a lot easier to do than this. So um, x-rays are helpful again to rule out um, arthritis. There are some subtle signs that you can sometimes see on an x-ray which are suspicious for uh, an ACL, but the uh, main uh, gold standard for diagnosing an ACL tear is with an MRI. So here's a normal MRI again. You can see the dark stripe of the ACL, which is obviously in continuity with the femur and the tibia. Here's an MRI of a torn ACL. Uh, so you can see it come up. It's a little bit wavy. It doesn't have the normal tension, and it's not attached to the femoral side. Um, and this is what a, a reconstructed ACL looks like. So you can see some of the fixation shadow up here with a, a nice robust tendon coming into the uh, tibia down here. So ACL reconstructions uh, have uh, is one of the most uh, common orthopedic sports procedures done. Uh, we do a lot of them at the BI uh, Plymouth here. Uh, things have evolved uh, quite a bit since I started doing them years ago using metal screws and uh, thinking there was no difference between using a cadaver tendon or a um, autograft, which means using your own tendon. Uh, most commonly used are the patella tendon, the mid middle third of the patella tendon, or that the hamstrings. So two of the medial hamstrings, the gracilis and semitendinous, can be harvested, which is actually what this graft is. Uh, since you have four hamstrings, the two on the lateral side remain, uh, and then the, the, the medial hamstrings will, will regrow, regenerate over the course of time that it takes typically for the ACL to heal. So it's a good graft. It's actually my favored graft. Um, but what has changed is the uh, procedure is done now uh, arthroscopically. Uh, we use a lot more uh, biomaterials, resorbable screws, uh, and then the rehab has changed as well. Uh, there's been shown that an accelerated rehab program where you're getting back to sports in as soon as six months has similar results to the more traditional rehab where you're looking at nine months to a year uh, before lifting restrictions. Uh, and it's now done almost entirely arthroscopically. So these little uh, jigs or uh, tip aiming devices allow us to place the tunnels for the new ACL graft with a high degree of um, accuracy. Uh, this is done through the, the um, medial portal. Uh, so your two uh, five millimeter incisions in the front of the knee, your camera's over here. You're looking directly at the tip of your guide. And then through typically a, about a one and a half to two inch incision down here, you can not only make your tunnel for the graft, but you can also harvest the hamstring. So, uh, and if you're using an, uh, an auto, uh, a cadaver graft, then the incision can be even smaller, although mine are pretty uh, similar in size. And same thing for the uh, femoral side. So one thing that's changed, that I've changed, is instead of drilling through the tibial tunnel uh, uh, to place this graft, which tends to make your graft a little bit more vertical, uh, or your tunnel, which has been shown to be less stable than if you have the graft more down at the 2, 230, position, so if this is a clock face, you're looking at 12 o'clock, so 3 o'clock, somewhere closer to the 3 o'clock position actually recreates the, the ACL with more uh, accuracy. So we're using different types of guides through the, this medial portal uh, to, get that angle prop, to get that angle properly placed. Um, and then the fixation devices now, we're using bioabsorbable screws that dissolve and form bone. Uh, there used to be a problem with these tunnels getting wider over time through osteolysis, particularly with the metal screws, uh, and then various, uh, again, um, biomaterials uh, as pin fixation across the, the, the femur holding, in this case, again, a hamstring graft, uh, uh, which um, allow for very solid fixation, earlier rehab. Uh, I usually get uh, unlocked the brace, uh, which is a hinged knee brace, by one week and let them walk around on it, uh, pretty much full range of motion uh, starting one week after surgery because I'm confident with the sec uh, sec um, security of these devices. Um, we're using more uh, autograft as well, back to the graft choice. 
uh, particularly in younger patients, there's been kind of a shift just over the past couple of years where, again, you used to tell patients the same uh, outcomes, whether you use your own tendon or uh, a cadaver tendon, um, and less surgery, not having, to, uh, not having as much post-operative pain if, if you use a cadaver tendon, so there was, those were actually more popular for a while. Um, we now know that's not necessarily the case, particularly with younger high school or college-aged athletes. Uh, they do better using their own, own tendon. There's a lower failure rate. So I'm using almost primarily uh, autograft or hamstring, or in some cases patella tendon, for my younger high school, college-age uh, athletes. Uh, so osteochondral defects. Um, these are... Uh, sort of pre-arthritic conditions, so to speak. So it's an otherwise normal knee where you have an injury, where you fall and um, bang a piece of cartilage off one of the joint surfaces and these can produce loose bodies. Uh, in a younger patient, there's a condition called osteochondritis desiccans, which is a little bit misunderstood or not completely understood why it occurs, but you get a little loosening of a cartilage fragment, usually in the same place on the medial, on the, uh, medial side of the lateral femoral condyle uh, that can often break loose and produce these little loose fragments that float around the knee. But if you have an otherwise normal knee with just one small isolated area, a little pothole, so to speak, in the cartilage, that can be fixed now. Um, so the, uh, again, history, exam, x-rays, often very similar to what you see with meniscal tears, uh, but the MRI shows, or the x-ray shows little loose fragments floating around. Um, and then the, uh, on the MRI, you see an actual defect uh, or disruption in the cartilage there. Uh, so a variety of uh, arthroscopic and um, open procedures have, have evolved over the years. Microfracture is kind of the first uh, line of uh, treatment for a smaller defect, typically something that's less than about a centimeter and a half in diameter. Um, and then there are uh, OATS procedures, which are uh, os um, uh, osteochondral allograft transfers, meaning taking a piece of cartilage from somewhere in the knee and re-implanting it where the, where the weight-bearing portion is. And then there are various cartilage implants, ranging from using uh, taking a piece of cartilage out of the knee, sending it off to a lab in Cambridge, and having them grow it uh, into lots of cells that you can then re-implant in the knee. Uh, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So microfracture is by far the most common procedure I do for these defects. And the idea is to use these little cartilage awls. Uh, they're basically just picks, pointy picks that you can use through a, um, uh, the, your arthroscopy portal. So you find this lesion here, you notice that the shoulders are stable, you, you probe it. And if that's the case, you can create almost a perfectly round uh, pothole, so to speak, and you use a curette to clean up the edges so there's no loose cartilage. And then you have to remove this so-called calcified layer, which is the top of the subchondral bone, uh, allowing for new cartilage to grow. And then you use these little picks to poke little holes into that subchondral bone into the, into the marrow uh, of the femur or the tibia, mostly the femur, which is uh, stem cells. So you get a little um, blood clot that forms uh, from the stem cells this is one of the earliest uses of stem cells that I'm aware of, uh, uh, so to speak. But uh, that you get this blood clot that fills in the defect that then can evolve into cartilage. It's scar cartilage, so-called fibrocartilage, so it's not quite as good as the original stuff and not quite as durable. Uh, but it, here it is pre-op on the MRI. This is what it looks like. So the dark line is the subchondral bone. This gray line is all new cartilage, so not quite as uniform and thick as the surrounding cartilage, but it's better than having a pothole. And this is what it looks like arthroscopically when you, when you uh, go back and take a second look with a camera. So other forms of cartilage defects, these are kind of newer generation or more often, in my experience, something that I use when the microfracture fails. Uh, so this is the original ACI, or autologous chondrocyte implantation, uh, more for historical purposes. This, is not, this has kind of been supplanted by other newer technologies, but an open procedure, so you have to take a little cartilage, uh, periosteal patch, so the lining of the bone, uh, transfer it to the defect, and use these little tiny sutures to sew it into place, uh, and then 
having already harvested some cartilage that has been grown up in a lab, three weeks later you come back and you squirt it in underneath this patch and then that regrows. So it works very well, but very uh, intensive, expensive, two-stage procedure. So that has now been replaced by uh, similar procedures, again, based on the same idea of harvesting cartilage, growing it up in a lab, but then in the lab they can be transferred to these scaffolds, uh, car uh, collagen scaffolds, which can be cut into uh, custom sizes and fits to just then at the time of surgery, instead of messing with a uh, periosteal patch, you just stick it into place like a, like a little patch with some glue uh, with very similar results. Uh, this is another procedure called osteochondral uh, autograph transplantation or OATS where you use these specialized dowels to remove pieces of cartilage from the knee from typically a non-weight bearing surface. So this is up kind of behind the kneecap but off to the side where you can take these dowels and then transfer them to the defect. Uh, and it's a, this is called a mosaic plasty because you're using several of them to fill in the gap uh, and also effective. Uh, for treating these, but, uh, and then for the bigger fragments uh, or bigger defects where you're talking uh, three centimeter area uh, cartilage loss or more, those other procedures tend not to work. There's just not enough cartilage in the knee to, tr to transfer or the, it's just too big of an area for a stable microfracture or uh, ACI to work. You can use these allografts, which are taking literally a piece of, um, cartilage from a cadaver knee, fresh frozen, so these cartilage cells are viable, uh, and cut them to size and implant them, and also very effective. Uh, and all these procedures have variations that can be done arthroscopically. And then there's the new, the kind of the latest generation, which are using particulated juvenile cartilage. So uh, harvested, I don't need to get into too much of the details, but these are viable cells from an otherwise healthy donor uh, that can be turned into clots, uh, and as a single stage procedure, can, you can implant viable living cartilage cells into these defects, uh, also with high degrees of success. So none of them are perfect, but the, uh, the science is quickly moving forward. Um, so um, quickly, I'll cover some hip arthroscopy. A lot of the same principles apply. Hip arthroscopy has evolved something that I'm doing more and more in my practice. Indications are loose bodies, labral tears, either debridement or repair. Osteochondral defects to some degree, uh, you can microfracture, although it's a less, lot less common in the hip than in the knee. And then femoral acetabular impingement, uh, and then to le far less common instability, synovial disease, uh, adhesive capsulitis or stiff joint, uh, and washouts for an infected hip. Um, there are some contraindications, uh, particularly born, poor bone quality. You're using um, traction to uh, open up the hip joint, so an osteoporotic hip or uh, uh, could run the risk of fracture. Uh, the, the hip joints deep down inside, underneath a bunch of muscles and other structures that uh, can make severe obesity uh, an impediment. So that, that our indications are expanding. So femoral acetabular impingement is a condition first described uh, several couple of decades ago, uh, where this is a normal hip, and actually Aaron's gonna probably talk about this, so I may not dwell on it. Uh, but you get these pincer lesions that can then mash the, the, menis uh, the labrum, uh, causing labral tears, uh, and is believed to be uh, caused by uh, deformities of the femoral neck, either from previous conditions as a child or as a disease process into, unto itself, meaning you're born with it. Uh, and it can cause labral tearing, articular breakdown, or uh, arthritis. And traditionally, we're treated with big, giant surgeries with open hip dislocations and removing bone with saws and so forth, uh, and is believed to be a major cause of idiopathic arthritis. So uh, these are what pincer impingements look like on x-ray. Again, I'll leave that up to Aaron. This is what the uh, cam impingement looks like on the femoral side. This is what it looks like arthroscopically when we're removing it arthroscopically through the tiny poke holes. So this is what a pincer lesion looks like through, so this is an overhang of the acetabular cup. The, you can barely make out the femoral head down here and the labrum is along this area as, as well. So this is what it looks like after that's been removed. You can see the raw bone here. Some of the labrum has been removed as well. And then this is what the cam side, so the bump on the femoral head neck head neck junction can be removed and that's the before and after. Um, so 
the labral repairs are still kind of uh, undergoing um, evolution. Uh, labrum is a little different than it is in the, the, the shoulder, for example, in that the hip joint's this deep socket that has inherent stability, so we know the labrum's not, uh, doesn't play a role in stability. Uh, but it's there, uh, and theories are that it's a shock absorber, or lubricates the joint, or maintains pressure, joint fluid within the joint. Uh, so preservation is likely important. So even though results seem similar whether you repair it or not, or just debride it, uh, we're working towards repairing it, particularly in younger patients. Uh, and the, the techniques are very similar to what you do with the labrum in the shoulder. Here's the acetabular rim with a detached labrum. This is capsule up here, kind of hard to see, but this is after the capsule's been mobilized and some of the pin pincer lesion has been removed. And then here's the labrum reattached and you can make out some of the stitches which are anchors, which are actually the exact same anchors we use for rotator cuff repairs and other uh, labral repairs in the shoulder, uh, just with longer applicators because it's deeper down. Uh, real quick, you know, ankle scopes I do infrequently. Uh, there is a role, uh, very similar indications for the knee uh, and the hip, loose bodies, osteochondral defects, and lateral ligament repairs. And even though it's a small joint uh, that's pretty constrained, you'd be amazed what you can see through various different portals uh, into the ankle joint. You can pretty much visualize the entire thing. Uh, that, and then one last touching briefly upon this, this is actually an office-based arthroscopy unit um, where uh, you can introduce a very, it's barely larger than a spinal needle with a fiber optic camera in it. And again, there are various different versions of this. This is an older version that I played around with a couple of years ago um, that can be done right then and there in the office. And the indications are, uh, if you think the MRI may be inaccurate, which is only 90, 92% sensitive or specific for these types of injuries. If you wanna look at the articular surface to see if someone's a candidate for a partial knee replacement or a complete knee replacement. Uh, Post-surgical looks, if you had done a meniscal repair or in the shoulder a rotator cuff tear and you wanna see if the repair is healed, you can take a look at it this way. Um, and if there are contraindications to an MRI, pacemakers, whatnot. Um, and it's accurate, real-time, minimally invasive. It's still in its infancy, but something that's probably coming down the, the, the pipeline and something I've already played around with in the office and is pretty exciting. Any questions? <laughs>